glad to welcome you to uh, our second installment of Power Couples of the Hindu Pantheon. So last week, or sorry, just on Tuesday rather, uh, we looked at Shiva and a few iterations of the goddess. Today, we are going to be looking at Ram and Sita, or Rama and Sita, as I'll try to remember to say, but I'll switch back and forth. Don't get confused. Sometimes there are uh, A's on the ends of things and sometimes not. And it doesn't mean anything except that uh, my brain is slowly dying. Um, so Ram, this fellow here, or Rama, and Sita uh, sitting there on his lap. Over here we have Lakshman. Um, we'll get to that and why he's there. But uh, So this is actually, um, as, as you can all read, it's... Um, this is sort of a, an advertisement or a flyer for an event at the Padrachalam temple, which is probably the most famous Rama temple in, uh, in South Asia, at least. We're going to come back to this image. There's, there's something very distinctive about the way that it portrays Rama that's going to be of some interest to us. But before we get going, it just I want to spin this idea out a little bit so that we can kind of compare Shiva and... Uh, whichever forms of the goddess you prefer, you want to call her Parvati or Gauri or whatever, with Ram and Sita, um, and potentially other uh, iterations of this kind of, um, we could call it maybe a holy binary or something if we want to try to transpose it into uh, comparable theological terms. Uh, but this way of looking at God as a couple. Um, so... We have Shiva and Shakti, we'll just call her Shakti for, for the sake of simplicity. Um, today we'll look at Ram and Sita, but just to kind of um, to give a, a foretaste or a bit sort of a larger context of what we're doing, um, are, there other, are there other divine couples we can think of that, that might also kind of fit this mold? Anybody? Sorry? Yes. Who is Lakshmi the consort of? Vishnu, right. Vishnu and Lakshmi. Um, they're going to be particularly important for us today because we're going to see the idea that Ram and Sita are incarnations actually of Vishnu and Lakshmi. Who else? You think of this, uh, that's, a good, that's a good jumping off point. Any other uh, avatars of Vishnu that you might think of? Yes. Exactly. Krishna and Radha, we're going to see uh, in the coming weeks um, also as incarnations of Vishnu and Lakshmi. Um, sometimes you'll also see Krishna and Rukmini, this is his actual wife. Radha is just his, like, you know, teenage love interest kind of figure, technically. But Rukmini, his wife, is also sometimes spoken of as an avatar of Lakshmi. Um, and then those of you who are in my sections, I know we've dealt with this. Do you remember back to your, uh, your chapter 10 of Flood? We saw a very early example of this kind of male-female um, duality in the readings on Samkhya. Does anyone remember this? Or have anything else to add? I see some tentatively raised hands. So go ahead and ask them. The primary duality... Um, in the Samkhya philosophical tradition, the one with the, the gunas the, um, that we discussed in such detail with relation to the Gita. Yes, I? Now, it's been a few weeks, and you've had the midterm, and you've had break, and you've forgotten everything probably that happened in between. But we're talking about Purusha and Prakriti. Say, you know, and this is the Purusha is the male principle here, and Prakriti is the female sort of uh, mother nature. So the, the witnessing consciousness, so to speak, something roughly comparable to, uh, to the Nirgun Brahman kind of idea, uh, Purusha and Prakriti, uh, sort of mother nature, if you will. So this is a very old, old idea um, that goes back even perhaps to the Upanishads in some ways that. Uh, that on some level, ultimate reality is a, a duality, and that that has a gendered aspect to it. So th this works in different ways, though, and one thing that, that we'll see, you know, we talked about on Tuesday, or Jay talked about the idea that 
you know, Shiva is really dependent on Shakti, right? This, uh, Shiva can't do anything without her. He's like a corpse without Shakti. This is an idea that has some resonances in the relationship between Vishnu and Lakshmi, but it's, it's not quite as strong. Vishnu isn't quite as dependent on uh, his wife, so to speak. Um, so we'll, we'll see a little bit also about um, how that works, and we can certainly see it uh, in Rama's uh, behavior. So let's turn to this idea first that, that Rama is, uh, on some level, uh, Vishnu, or rather that, let's start with the idea that Rama is sort of God. So this is one place that we've seen Rama already. We've seen Rama in the poetry of these figures, these Virguni poet saints, like Kabir and Ravidas, some of these figures that use the name Ram to refer to ultimate reality in a sort of near guni uh, formless sense. Um, and there are even these kind of guys associated with this tradition, although, you know, Vishnu is a very sort of, uh, generally speaking, a fairly conservative kind of figure. You know, he's a, um, he's a law and order sort of solar deity. Um, but you do get these kinds of guys, nonetheless, with their dreadlocks and their cannabis pipes. Um, here they're, they're in Nepal. Uh, these guys are of a sex, they're called Ramanandis. Um, the certain traditions stipulate that Ramanand was actually the guru of Kabir and of Ravidas. Um, you can tell, though, that they are of this sect and that they're not Shaivas or something, even though they're at a Shiva temple, because of the sectarian markings here, this sort of V-shape. They've got it here, and this guy's got it on his belly, too. Um, that's exactly what you see here. When you see these kind of sadhus um, with that marking, you can generally um, tell what their uh, affiliation is. Another telltale sign here is that they're still wearing the sacred thread. Those sadhus would actually dispense with their thread, perform their own funerals, um, and, and go about life as if they are uh, themselves already liberated. Uh, in this tradition, in the Ramanandi tradition, you don't do that because there's a theological position that only God can liberate you. There's a sort of a theology of, of grace, and that's, um, that's something that plays out because, or plays out in their continuing to wear the sacred thread. Um, but so there are those traditions that uh, focus on Ram as a sort of near gun uh, uh, deity, uh, but most traditions see. Ram, generally speaking, uh, as an avatar of Vishnu. And this picture has no significance other than that I just think it's kind of cool looking. But, um, so, but one thing that you can see here, this is, a, this is Vishnu standing on the causal waters. What I want to draw your attention to here um, is this idea, if you see that he's got the conch and the discus in his hands, although it's uncommon at the Padrachalam temple, you will see here, um, or you, you might have to sort of take my word for it, but trust me, it's there. This Rama has four arms, and there's the conch over here and the discus back here, and he holds the bow and arrow, which is pretty standard, but he's got these other things um, as well. So they've gone out of their way to identify Rama with Vishnu um, in that image. So, when we say, though, that Rama is an avatar of Vishnu, what do we mean? It's a little more complicated than, um, than what we've seen so far. But what does that mean? What does an avatar mean? OK, an incarnation. Specifically, can we, can we narrow that down? Under what circumstances do we get an avatar? Yes. Exactly, great. So I'm going back to the Bhagavad Gita, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, where Krishna says that when, when he was speaking as Vishnu, or some would argue speaking as himself, but whatever the case, that when there's an increase in evil and when righteousness is on the decline, then Vishnu incarnates in order to set things right, basically. So you get these avatars in the kind of make or break situation. Something has gone really wrong, Vishnu being the 
maintainer of order and the preserver of the universe steps in, he intervenes to do this. And as Gaetan pointed out, we, we're looking at Rama in this particular context, this often happens, um, as we saw before, that you get a very powerful demon, um, he's done a bunch of austerities and things like that and become essentially invincible um, and Vishnu has to, to step in. So we have that idea of an avatar. Now I want to contrast that a little bit with the situation with Sita, right? So uh, Sita is supposed to be an incarnation uh, of the goddess Sri or Lakshmi, right? The goddess of wealth, good fortune, auspicious things like that. Um, she is, does anybody remember how Sita is born? Do you know this story? They find her a furrow in the earth and they're like planting her. Exactly, right. So Sita means a furrow and she's sort of born, it's miraculously born um, out of the earth. Um, and the earth is herself, of course, a goddess. So she's an incarnation, but we want to be careful when we're talking about an avatar because that, that has a certain connotation of, of coming to do this very specific thing. An avatar comes to sort of fix something, um, whereas there are a variety of, of incarnations. So just to sort of uh, to be specific what we're talking about here. Right, and so Sita is uh, an incarnation of Lakshmi, who you see represented here on this um, second century BCE uh, Diwali card. So, and Lakshmi, you know, everyone loves Lakshmi. It's, I, I also want to point this out. One of the things we're going to see is that, you know, the Ramayana is not something that's strictly confined necessarily to uh, Hindu traditions. It's not strictly even confined within Hindu traditions to people who think that Rama is a, a full avatar, if you want to think of it that way. And Lakshmi is kind of the same way. The Buddhists worship Lakshmi, the Jains worship Lakshmi. Um, nobody has a problem with Lakshmi except um, for her evil twin. Um, she has an evil twin, a uh, Lakshmi. But other than that, everyone loves Lakshmi. So, um, so this is something with sort of wide, wide resonances. But in our case, you see her here on her own. In our case, what we want to uh, emphasize is this way in which you have a, an association of Lakshmi with Vishnu, specifically. That's why Sita is here. She's here to accompany uh, Ram. And so here we see Vishnu and Lakshmi, and this is done in Andhra Pradesh um, at a famous temple. So Vishnu sleeping on Shesha, the, the serpent, and the, the famous image that the serpent is, is what's left over after the, the big crunch, basically, right? That little bit of matter and whatnot that's still there. Vishnu sleeps on that. Lakshmi hangs out there giving him a foot rub, right? So there is um, a bit of... Uh, well, it's a patriarchal sort of uh, marriage relationship, uh, more so than what you might find in a, a Shaiva context. Incidentally, Lakshman is supposed to be the incarnation of the serpent. So, uh, the, the association here is one where Vishnu in general and, and Rama perhaps in particular are associated with the householder traditions, right? They're associated, and particularly the, the paradigmatic householder, as opposed to an ascetic, right? The, um, the paradigmatic householder is the king, right? So there, there's a, a way in which you're talking about a, a particular ideal of what life is supposed to be like, what the good life is supposed to be like, what your duties are, um, that doesn't necessarily involve running off to the forest to wear tiger skins and meditate and try to get liberation. So uh, this is something that, um, that we'll see as, as we go in, and look in the, into more detail at the story. So, you know, we have these avatars of Vishnu. There are, you know, people commonly say 10. Some texts give lists of up to 22 avatars of Vishnu. And Rama is supposed to be the, <coughs> what, which number? Seven. Seven, great. One, one funny thing that actually happens in this, uh, in the Ramayan um, that doesn't, that didn't make it into the, the Narayan text that you had is actually Rama meets the previous avatar. Why he's still there is, a, is an odd question. Theologically, it's kind of murky. Maybe that's why he left him out. 
But Rama with the axe is apparently still around. Uh, when Rama is coming back from having broken Shiva's bow, he's like 13 years old, um, Rama, they're just headed back um, to Ayodhya, and Rama with the axe shows up. And whenever they see him, everyone freaks out because Rama with the axe, you know, his thing is killing Kshatriyas. That's like his whole point of his incarnation is that he kills the Kshatriyas, wipes them out. So everyone says, hey, no, 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 come on. Like, you've, you've done your thing already. Um, you've got rid of all the evil kings. And Rama's just a boy anyways. Like, he hasn't done anything. So, you know, don't, don't make any trouble. We don't need any trouble. And, and Parashuram, the, the Rama with the axe, just basically ignores them and looks at, at Rama and says, hey, little man, I heard you broke Shiva's bow, but guess what? That one had a crack in it. I've got the other one that, um, that the architect of the gods gave to Vishnu. If you can string it, uh, then I will honor you with a duel. And of course, Rama strings it, puts an arrow on it, and says, well, now I've pulled the arrow. I've got to shoot you. Um, what's it going to be? I can, you know, I can either paralyze you, or I can just zap all your austerities that you've worked so hard to, to accumulate this merit and magic powers and whatnot. So Rama with the axe says, you know, take my austerities, and, uh, and then he wanders off. So maybe there's a bit of a sort of a passing of the torch scenario there, but... Um, there, there's a way in which uh, Rama's avatar is uh, shown to be, in some level, superior to the previous uh, avatar. Yeah. Um, I think it's between. I mean, it depends on how. But I think in the Valmiki, it's between the. It's just after the Swayamvar. So when she chooses him, they're like engaged, but before the actual wedding. So all avatars are essentially, they're not quite created equal, I guess, is what I'm getting at here. And, and this is one thing that we'll see, particularly um, when you think about how, it, what, how much attention these guys get in the tradition. You know, who has temples? Who has uh, ascetic traditions associated with them? So, you know, Krishna is, is universally regarded as a full avatar. Uh, of Vishnu. He's, you know, 100% Vishnu. And there are also actually traditions that think of Krishna as the ultimate reality himself. But you don't really get these traditions in relation to, say, the tortoise avatar, or traditions that, you know, are really fully focused on the dwarf avatar, or things like that. But Rama, you do. It, it's, it's questionable to what degree Rama is supposed to be a full avatar. In Valmiki, in the Sanskrit, the oldest iteration of the Ramayana that we have, Valmiki seems to suggest that Rama is one half Vishnu. There's this whole scene where uh, Dasarat, the, 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 the king, does uh, a sacrifice in order to, to get sons, and a messenger comes down from heaven with this like rice pudding, this <laughs> divine sort of rice pudding, and says, give this to the queens and they will conceive sons. And he divides it out amongst the queens, um, so he gives half of it to Kalsalya, and three-eighths to Sumitra, and Kakei gets one-eighth. Um, so, and then there's another place where he actually specifically says Rama is one-half of Vishnu. Um, the math is a little wonky, because then it also says that, that Parath is one-fourth Vishnu, and his mother only got one-eighth. But, you know. The, the point is here that, uh, that the, the degree to which Rama is a full avatar or knows that he's a full avatar is something that is, is contested in various ways. And we'll actually see points in the text where, where the gods step in to remind him, hey, don't forget, you know, you, you're Vishnu, you have to do things in a certain way, or like, don't get upset. You know, so we'll, we'll see some of that as well. So why don't we pause for a second? Are there, are there other, other questions about this? We'll, we'll explore, before we get deeper into sort of the character of Rama specifically, um, to kind of um, take questions, if there are any, about the, the sort of theological status of, uh, of Rama. Not that I can promise to be able to answer them, but, you know. You're all thoroughly confused to the point that you don't have questions. 
Okay. Yes. That's a, he just says one half. Um, and there are, I think, there are people who want to, because the word for half, I mean, you, they, there are people who try to say, oh, it must, that can't be possibly what he meant. So um, they try to say that there's some other word there. And, so, I mean, there are people who have a, a beef with this idea, but um, he just says that, that Rama is one half Vishnu. And then part of the fourth, and the other two sons are that they are portions of Vishnu. He doesn't specify um, exactly how that's supposed to work. But he does say that, yeah. So is the, is the notion of them being more or less Vishnu like based on like their self-awareness? Like Krishna knows that he's Vishnu, but Rama doesn't know that. And I mean, the whole idea of you know, Atman knowing yourself, knowing me, is that mm -hmm. tied in or is that just part of the story? Um, I think it depends on, on which story you okay. get. Yeah. Right. So I mean, in the Narayan, there it seems like there are a lot of places um, where Rama does seem to know what is going on, or at least you've got sort of an omniscient narrator that's sort of telling you that um, that he's doing things for these reasons. But in Valmiki, it's sometimes murkier, and in certain other contexts, you know, the sort of the later on you get, and the more developed the cult of Rama becomes then people sort of push that whole thing to the side and he knows, he's fully aware from the jump of what's going on. So, um, I raised the point really, rather than being able, we're not gonna be able to sort of settle the issue, but to sort of to let you know that there are a variety of opinions, there's a spectrum of opinions about exactly to what degree Rama is uh, aware of the fact that he's Vishnu or even to what degree he is Vishnu. Yeah. Are there any major differences between Balaki's version and Tulsi Doctor's wrong trip on? There are. Okay. Um, there are some pretty some pretty heavy differences. One I mean one of which that we'll look at involves the, the trial by fire and the kidnapping and things like that. Um, he, he does some interesting things with the plot. Where they basically make an illusory Sita. She never actually goes anywhere. Um, and just sort of he hides her off with the with Agni, the fire god, and sort of she reappears at the end. So the whole thing has been uh, an illusion. She never really got kidnapped and things like that. There's some, there are definitely some pretty big differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you mean? I mean, authenticity is, uh, I mean, what, I'm not sure how we could, I mean, I'm certainly not in a position to adjudicate that. The Valmiki version is older, but, you know, what's authentic is, is what people, what resonates with people, right? What sort of, what people agree on to a certain degree. And it might well be the case. I mean, realistically, it probably is the case that um, a lot of people are much more familiar with Tulsidas than with Valmiki, or with Kamban, or with you know the Ramayana that was on TV back in the you know back in the eighties, um, and you know that may shape people's ideas of who Rama is and what the story is um, in a way that is um, that sort of. Is much more has more of an impact than Valmiki. So, I uh, mean, what's authentic is what people do, right? But I mean, there are certain people who are very invested, uh, and there, there's a big controversy over this actually. And this idea that there are, it was at Delhi U uh, last year, I think it was. They in one of the graduate seminars, they read this essay by A.P. Ramanujan. Um, it's called many Ramayanas, and it goes and it compares different Ramayanas from different places and talks about the variety of um, differences you find in the plot and things like that. And there were certainly people who were very disturbed by this. Right? The idea that, that all these texts don't necessarily match up, and specifically that they don't match with Valmiki, was, was a, I mean, there are people protesting outside the university and things like that. Um, it was a big, a big controversy. You can still, if you Google it, um, there there were articles on the BBC and things like that about it. Um, 
And there are certainly people for whom Valmiki is the, the gold standard, but, but I, I wouldn't take that position myself. So this gets us to uh, the, the second point that I wanted to, to bring up is that, you know, for a lot of the history of the Ramayana, if we can think of it that way, Rama is just, uh, or foremost in any case, an epic hero. So the Ramayana is something that is not just in Sanskrit, but it's very popular throughout Southeast Asia. And there's a lot of that even. Here's one from Java where you can see Rama going after, and um, this is supposed to be the deer, kind of a ferocious looking deer. Um, but you know, in, in sort of puppet shows and things like that, you get these all throughout Southeast Asia, uh, marionettes in Burma and so on. Some of these are more devotional than others. Right? So Tulsi Das and the TV Ramayana are, are very devotional in that way. Something like this, which is from a contemporary Ramayana comic book, Ramayana 3392 AD, um, you know, you get Rama, he's basically sort of a Conan figure in a post-apocalyptic um, world. Robin is some kind of nanotechnological monster. So there, there are, some of these aren't even Hindu, some of them aren't even religious necessarily. Um, there are Buddhist Ramayanas, Jain Ramayanas, you know, you can try to imagine that one. A, a Ramayana where it's with an emphasis on nonviolence is a little difficult um, to put together, but um, this all happens. There's even one um, 19th century Bengali one, uh, Mignapod Kabbo, which is sort of based on the idea of uh, emulating Paradise Lost. So it's in blank verse, the guy writes in Bengali blank verse, um, but where Robin is the hero and and Ram is the villain of this story. So people, you know, this story, it's said that, you know, no Indian ever hears the Ramayana for the first time. It's, it's something that's also true throughout a lot of Southeast Asia. People play with this story, they reinterpret it. Um, it's something that you get for entertainment, and it's embellished uh, with, you know, storytellers that'll, that'll turn up um, and tell the story for, you know, you just buy a block of time, basically. And you can, in, you can insert stories into it. We saw that a bit in the Cumberland, where they sort of, um, in sort of the earlier portion, as, as they're walking along, you see different things among the landscape, and, um, and they get stories about what happened here and there. So it, it opens itself up to that. Interestingly, the further south you get, the more common it is, Robin becomes more and more of an admirable character. So here, this is a temple in Sri Lanka. Uh, with an image of Robin. I just want to point out, although this is kind of a crazy looking um, sitar, Robin was supposed to have been a great musician. He was supposed to have been very much a ladies' man, great warrior. You know, he's uh, uh, obviously a, a very, very proficient at ascetic practices and things like that. Um, so in many ways, he's supposed to be a, a pretty, um, pretty admirable figure. He does what kings do, which is to say conquer things and, you know, and uh, make war and uh, enjoy life. All of these things are, are very much uh, valorized, only, you know, he does it perhaps to excess. Um, so that's one thing, you know, Robin's not necessarily a monster. He's a, he's a rakshasa, he's a demon um, by sort of class, but um, that doesn't mean that um, he has particular, necessarily evil nature. Um, his, his morality in this case um, is something where there's an element of choice in it. Um, but meanwhile, you know, back in sort of North India particularly, you get this scenario at, at Dushera, um, where people burn Robin in effigy. Um, it's been suggested, actually, that, that the Ramayana is on some level a, a mythological story about the Aryan invasion, if you can call it that. Remember back to like the first day of class and talking about this theory that um, these guys ran in on horses from around the Caspian Sea region through Persia and down into India and subjugated the peoples further down south. So if you think about it on those terms with, with Robin uh, down in Sri Lanka, right? And then just beyond actually the south, the southern coast of India and Rama's capital in North India and Ayodhya, and the idea of Rama making an alliance with these uh, monkeys and also some bears, 
to go and conquer the southern territories, essentially. There are people who think that this is a way of sort of dramatizing the victory of the sort of uh, invaders in the north of India over the southerners. So that's, that's one possibility that we can think of there. But the, the question of, of the original text um, that you brought up earlier, I mean, even, I want to point out that even the, the, the Valmiki version of this story is something that takes place over, it's a product of several centuries, you know, starting in the fifth or maybe the fourth century BCE. So, you know, just a little bit later than the time that the Mahabharata is being written you start to get the Ramayana. And, even, and that text itself is something where the first and last books seem to happen later than the core story. So that is to say, the core story is basically the one that picks up when Dasharatha uh, banishes Rama to the forest and you know it ends with the conquest of Lanka and the conquest of Rama. So all these stories at the beginning that's the sort of the core narrative. And the things at the very beginning where Rama, uh, you know, breaks through his bow and the marriage with Sita and the encounter with Rama with the axe and things like that, the stuff at the end, which, you know, actually Narayan doesn't give you. He says that it's later and that's kind of his excuse for not including it. Also, I think he just doesn't like it very much. The stuff at the end that we'll talk about as well um, is probably... Um, a bit later, maybe even I think second century BCE. These are these are actually the parts that really emphasize Rama as an avatar of Vishnu. So those sections of the text wherein his divine qualities are emphasized the most in in the Sanskrit are you know, probably a couple of centuries later than the core narrative. Um, so it's just something to to think of there. So. So how does Rama become more than just another avatar of Vishnu? How does Rama get to the point where you know he's got temples of his own, he's got these traditions in a way that um, that you don't find for the fish avatar, for instance? Well, it seems to happen fairly late. Actually, it seems to happen. You get scenes from the Ramayana on Shiva temples, because Rama in the Valmiki Ramayana actually is a devotee of Shiva. So you get scenes on Shiva temples from uh, the early medieval period, but Rama doesn't seem to be worshipped himself really until the 11th or 12th century. We don't find temples dedicated to Rama until the 11th or 12th century. Um, that is to say, about the time of the Tamil Ramayana, which is the you know what uh, the text that we read is based on. Um, and the, the, this is also the same time actually that, and I think this is a key point. This is the time that kings start to identify themselves with Rama. So this is a lot of what you get. And this, uh, this image here is from, it's in the Royal Palace in Bangkok, which is actually pretty close. You'll recognize this, I think. It's pretty close to the old capital uh, of Thailand, Ayutthaya, uh, which you can see is kind of a, um, a version of a Yodhya. You get kings now, they identify themselves with Rama around this time period because the reign of Rama, this Ram Rajya, is something that is a perfect, it's kind of supposed to be a perfect political order. Everything happens just like it's supposed to, it's a perfect sort of a golden era. So Rama is the ideal king, um, who's also the ideal man. And you can see this kind of a, uh, in the, if Rama is then also God, and the king is Rama, then the king is God, right? Two things are equal to something else, or also equal to each other. So it, you can work it into a theory where you sort of get a kind of divine kingship notion by identifying the king with Rama. And this is happening around the same time, that Rama is really sort of coming into his own as an avatar of Vishnu. Um, you're getting these cults uh, based around Rama. So you get some really um, impressive temples here. This is, this is probably the other uh, most famous temple uh, to Rama that you, that you find. Um, this is the Thousand Rama Temple. At least that's one way of interpreting uh, the name. This is in Vijayanagar. 
in Karnataka. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, actually. It's called the Thousand Rama Temple because there are all these scenes from the Ramayana all along the walls, along the pillars. Hopefully that adds up to about a thousand Ramas. There's a detail from one you can see him stringing Shiva's bow. Really, really you know, impressive uh, architecturally. So let's pause again here then. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you pretty quickly. And, and sort of open up for, for questions if you, if you have any. Or, you know, comments or cries of outrage. You know, I'm presenting this from a particular point of view. It doesn't, um, I should, you know, contextualize it to say that, you know, I'm, I've got a, a sort of historical bias about these things. I'm presenting it according to my own um, my own bias is there, so um, that's worth noting as well. But are there any thoughts about um, about that thought process? Where is the temple? Um, it's in Vijayanagar, uh, in in Karnataka. Okay. Um, the nearest city, like the nearest proper city, is. It was a you know a major uh, major dynasty um, down there, one of the, the last sort of major um, Hindu dynasties, if you will. Um, it persisted well into the uh, well into the Middle Period. So this was actually this temple was the was the royal temple. So it's inside the sort of palace complex there at the city. This is this was the private temple. Good to go forward. So it's there's something else. That's, let's let's look at the text itself briefly here. Um, and by that I mean Valmiki. The Ramayana is a different kind of text from anything we've seen so far. So so far we've seen texts that are sruti. So that means what what kind of texts? Right, like revealed scripture texts, right? The Vedas, the, um, the Upanishads. And we've seen some texts that are smithy, texts that are remembered. This includes what kind of things? The Gita, right? In fact, the whole Mahabharata, the class of, of this text includes things that um, purport to be history. The Mahabharata uh, is part of that. Um, Shankara, possibly, yeah. I mean, any it includes texts that are that are shastric, that are um, that are meant to be sort of that instruct you in dharma and things like that. So, so I'll just get into that idea. But the, the Ramayana, although some people do think of it as uh, as an historical text. Um, the Ramayana is something that is explicitly a literary text, and it's the first one that we've encountered. It's also supposed to be the very first literary text ever, at least in Sanskrit. Um, it's attributed to Valmiki, who is supposed to be the very first Sanskrit poet. Incidentally, before he becomes a poet, does anybody know what his, his previous occupation was? Yes. Yeah. Murderer? Yeah, he was a highwayman. He was like a, a bandit kind of figure. But then he got religion, right? He had he had his like, come to Vishnu moment, basically, where um, you know he's mugging this guy, and the guy says, "You know, does your family know your family who you're supporting with this line of work? Do they know what you do?" And Dominique says, "No." Do you think they would want the karma that would come from you know living off of you know you killing people and taking their stuff? And so Valmiki decides instead he's going to undergo a penance, um, and he sits unmoving and meditates for so long that he gets covered in ant hills. Valmiki means ant hills. So this, is, this is how he becomes um, who he is. But we look at the frame story of the Ramayana. What happens? We see Valmiki. He goes to the sage Nara. And they have this conversation. He says, is there 
a perfect man, someone who always does exactly what's right, who is you know, uh, courageous, and so forth and so on, and gives this long list of all the qualities that you want in a perfect person. And Nard says, yes, actually, it's wrong. And describes him that Valmiki then wanders off from this conversation. And he wanders down to the river, and he sees a couple of curlews, this sort of like aquatic birds that cook peaks. Um, and they're doing what comes natural. Um, and at that time, a hunter comes through and shoots one of them. And Valmiki is so upset by this, um, by seeing this, this happen, um, that he spontaneously just creates poetry there on the spot. So the Vedas are not poetry, remember. Right? The Vedas, even though it's like a lot of it seems poetic, it's revealed text, right? Nobody wrote the Vedas. So um, the Ramayana is not that kind of thing. So Valmiki says, you know, Mani Shava Patishtam Kwagamaha Shashpati Sama Yat Kram Cham Mitana Kam of a Di Kama Mohidam. It's just sort of spontaneous. If you're a cursed hunter, you will wander forever without rest because you've killed one of these birds in the throes of passion. So he has this moment where suddenly he realizes, oh, wait, that, there was a meter in that. I just kind of did that. And Brahma appears and says, you know what? That's pretty cool. You should write about Rama like that. Do that. So that's, this is why we get the story. Um, and this story of the creation of literature is embedded in the text. So this is something that um, the Ramayana is, it has a different way of communicating something to us. It has a different uh, mode. So it's said that the, the Veda commands you to do something, like a master or a guru, right? And the, the, the Shastras and the histories and things like that, they counsel you like a friend. But literature um, does something different. Literature sort of cajoles you. Literature coaxes you into doing something as a lover would. So this is the, the, what we're supposed to get from the Ramayana. Um, although there are people who insist that it's, it's history, but it's also clearly a literary text, doing something that's kind of beyond an instructional mode. It's supposed to look at the behavior of Rama and infer from that how we're supposed to act. And you see this in some literary textbooks as well. So, in uh, Manotapata's Kavya Prakasha, he says that literature imparts knowledge of proper conduct and coaxes and conjoles us like a lover. In the Sahitya Dharpana of Vishwanath Kaviraj, another literary textbook, so to speak, or a work of literary criticism, he's explicit about it. And what does it do? It says, well, one must conduct oneself like Rama and not like Rama. So this is, the, this is what you're supposed to get out of it. And, you, know, you can see this um, coming out of, of literary critical works later on. So, so what's the setting of the text? The setting, is, what's the, actually let's start with that, what's the, um, what's the yuga that we're dealing with here? When does this happen? Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but it's just that the text that we're talking about. There is a, there's a complaint at one point against Rama that we'll get to, where he says, you're acting like you think it's the Kali Yuga. Um, but that's a, that was more of a, uh, a complaint. So it's not the Kali Yuga. Yeah? We're closer. Um, right, that's the Treta Yuga. It's the, the second one. So there's the golden age, right? The Trita Yuga, and then the Treta Yuga, even though it looks like three, but it's a countdown, right, to our current age. So it's the one just after the golden age. In the golden age of the Trita Yuga, everyone does what's right, comes naturally, you know what you're supposed to do, and you just sort of do it. And everything goes fine. And in Mahabharata, which we've seen some of, right, the Mahabharata is the beginning of our age, where you don't even know what the right thing to do is. The best you can hope for is just kind of Try to keep your head down and, and hope that you know that Krishna will have some mercy on you when you die because everything's gone to hell and you can't even figure out what the right thing to do is if you wanted to. But this is much closer to that first age. It's in the second age, and, and what happens there is basically um, people still know what's right. The the sacrifices and things like that, that all still works just fine. 
The only downside is, and as we'll see throughout Jeremiah, um, doing what's right can make your life very difficult. And so, I mean, this is really kind of the, the, the point of the text in a way. You know, Sanskrit literary texts like the Ramayana have what's called a rasa. They have a dominant emotion that they display. And this can be, you know, these are things like, kind of like genre in a way. So there are horrific uh, works, and there are romantic works, and there are works that are heroic, and things like that. So uh, the Ramayana, any, anyone want to guess what the, the dominant sort of uh, aesthetic sentiment for the Ramayana is supposed to be? Uh, it is an epic, and I mean, in the sense that um, but that's that's not one of the, so the, the sentiments are erotic, heroic, uh, wrathful, fearful, disgusting, tragic. Uh, later on, they add devotional as one of them. There are a couple more. Uh, hell, I'll just give it to you. It's a tragedy. The point of the reminder is that it's a tragedy. We haven't really this stuff. I don't know. We'll extract that idea from you. Sorry. It's, it's a tragedy. It's, that's the point of the, the text, the karuna rasa, because the rasa of sort of, of sorrow. Because what you see is people who are doing the right thing, and it's leading them to a state where they have to suffer. Right? And that's, the, that's something that's supposedly that's new to the, to the trade that you go. Before, if you did the right thing, then everything worked out fine. Now you've just entered a state where Doing the right thing can also really mess up your life. And so when you when you look at the text and try to say, well, what are we supposed to get from this? Yeah, you're supposed to behave like Rama. But look what happens to Rama. I mean, it's not like he just has a great time. Right? He's banished to the forest, and his wife is kidnapped. And, I mean, it's and all along he's doing what's supposed to be the right thing. So, and there's loads and loads of here reading the Ramayana, you know, in first year Sanskrit. And it was really tiresome, at least for me at the beginning, because like, everyone was just constantly lamenting. It's just like one lament after another. It's like something awful happening, and you're like, oh, this is terrible, and you get a long lament. So I was, you know, I was kind of relieved when we, uh, we moved on from it, because um, it, it could be, it's not the kind of like Mahabharata downer where there's just like a sense of impending doom. But like everyone just keeps getting blindsided by it. Like, what? what happened? I did what was moral and ethical. What, why is this happening? Completely plummeted by it. So let's let's look at this. How being moral can make you miserable, right? That's the um, so from the beginning, Dasaratha, right? He is truthful. He keeps his word to his wife Kaitei, right? She has he has promised her um, a couple of boons, and when she calls them in, he has to do that. Right? We should be truthful. This is something that we should emulate. Rama specifically uh, upholds this. He says, I'm going to do whatever he says because people should keep their word. So what does he get for his trouble being truthful? Well, he has to banish his son, is the right way, um, and make this other son the king. Um, and then, I mean, this is a key moment. This is where the core story starts. So let's, let's briefly look at um, a couple other... Wow. A couple other aspects of, um, of Rama's response. So what else does Rama do here that is right, that's commendable? What, what else are we, are we supposed to take from Rama's response to the situation that, that we would also emulate? Yeah? Um, his brother wants to go and fight the other brother and just help him out, and he tells him don't do that, and what Rama does is say against his brother's mother as well. And that we should all like just go with what her father said, even though it was through her words. The father still admitted with these words as well. Great, yeah. So Lakshman, Lakshman is famously kind of a hothead um, and wants to go and fight. And and Rama says, no, don't do it. Not only should you not fight um, your mother, but you should, or our mother in this case, but you should also harbor no resentment toward them, for it, toward her, or toward him. So he's demonstrating filial piety, right? He's honoring his parents and doing what they're supposed to do. 
he's also demonstrating uh, equanimity. He's greeting the situation, which is a terrible situation for him, but he's greeting it um, in a calm way and encouraging others to, to take that same approach. All very long, right? I mean, that's a great thing to do. Um, except that he gets banished to the forest, his father dies of grief, um, then there's the wrong king on the throne now, and then his wife is kidnapped. Right? That's, this is what doing good things will do for you. Sita, likewise, dutiful wife, perfect in every way. Oh, you're going to the forest? Sure, yeah, I'm going to the forest. Wonderful. Um, wonderful sort of moment of devotion, uh, wifely devotion and things like that, that, you know, in this society, at least, um, we're supposed to uh, want to aspire to. Um, but we know how this turns out for her. And similarly, you know, she refuses Ravan, who, you know, isn't that bad of a guy, you know? Um, she's, she refuses him over and over again. I mean, she could have just become like queen of, of Lanka. Um, but in, and in return for that, she just has to live in captivity and wait on rescue. So um, that's what she gets for her devotion as well. But briefly, let me, um, because the, the version of Sita's kidnapping is different in what we read and what we find in Valmiki, um, I want to show you a bit of anime, which uh, actually follows the Valmiki a bit closer. So it's just about a 10 minute clip, but I just kind of pay attention to the mechanics of how um, this situation is going to play out. Um, how does it, what is it that causes um, the the kidnapping and so on, and and also to how Ram and Lakshmana treat Surpanika. You're so beautiful, strong, and handsome. I have this idea to marry you. <laughs> Your wish would be my command were it not for my wife seen that there. Yeah. Why don't you approach my brother, Lutchman? He is also very handsome and very strong. Oh, he is handsome too. I speak with your interests at heart. I'm only second to God, and I don't think you're the kind to settle for second best. Yes, you're right. I am the kind to settle only for the very best. <laughs> I'll introduce you to This is my wife, Sita. <laughs> Months. Sita, I wish I could just cry her beauty. Is she 
that beautiful? There is no one more beautiful than her in this whole world. Her waist is slim, her figure captivating, her complexion like molten gold. Oh, oh, a heavenly maid who is designed for you, my brother. She is not worthy of that rank. Oh, there surely is someone who is worthy of her, and that someone is you. <laughs> Sets out to kidnap Sita. Well, as we planned. Yes, as we planned. This is magnificent. <laughs> and this can surely deceive now. Step outside this line. Within this line, you are safe. I assure you. Everything goes just as I planned. Virtuous lady, I come begging for arms. Here you are. Oh, I am surprised. Somebody has drawn it to protect you. I cannot cross it. But you surely can come. No, no. If you do not feed this hungry sage with your own hands, then ruin shall fall upon your father's and father-in-law's house. Oh, noble lady.
So, um, so it's a little different than what you've read, right? I mean, the, the reason I show it to you there, um, well, what did you notice that was different? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so there's no, in the, in the version that you read, he couldn't touch her, right? So he had to pick up the ground, like he dug out some ground and then pick her up. So that's true. How does he, I mean, in the book, he just sort of shows up more or less as himself, right? He tries to convince her that uh, she should come with him. He's kind of like bragging about like how amazing. In this case, he comes as a in disguise. Um, but but what's the what's the moral principle here? What what would we want to uh, applaud in in Sita's behavior? Yes. Exactly right. It's a moral imperative. If a Brahmin ascetic comes begging at your door, you have to feed him. That's just that's not it's not an option to turn him away. Never mind the fact that he could curse you or whatever. But um, what she's doing is something that's exemplary. You're supposed to emulate that. You should feed, um, you know, hungry Brahmin ascetics. That's absolutely, um, it's absolutely the case. So. You know, there's a, um, I mean, it's also worth noting here that the, the way that they present it is, a, is also a way of making the women slightly more to blame than in the version that you read, right? So um, you get the situation where, you know, Surpanika is actually kind of goading Rava into going after Sita. You know, the, the episode sort of kicks off with her uh, wanting to, uh, wanting Ram for herself. And then like, Ram and Lushman have this weird thing where they sort of tease her and joke around with her, which isn't very nice. But, you know, so you get the women being sort of disproportionately to, to blame in this sense. So Panika is, is, uh, has this way that she's after Ram. Sita wants the deer. Um, you know, Kaikei in the beginning wants her son to be the king. You saw it in the Kamban version anyway. This character of Kuni or Mantara you find in, in some of the North Indian versions, who's like Kaikei's handmaiden that actually puts her up to it. So you like insert these extra sort of female characters to drive uh, the narrative in that way. But ultimately, what Sita gets for her generosity is she gets kidnapped. So again, uh, we see that you know this acting morally, acting ethically, um, is essentially punished. Similarly, Ram is engaging in this behavior that is laudable. He's acting heroically. That's what you want from, uh, from a Kshatriya. You're supposed to act in a heroic way. He's acting like a king, going out hunting. He wants to please his wife. These are all good things. You know, the pursuit of pleasure is a, is a valid goal in life. For a householder, that's part of what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to pursue pleasure of all sorts, and that would include things like hunting. Although, you know, hunting tends to be a bad sign in, in Sanskrit literary tradition. So, um, in a way, this is a cautionary tale. There's an aspect of it's a cautionary tale for kings. It's saying, you know, be careful about hunting and women. That's kind of, you know, these are good things for you. You're supposed to do that as a king, like, um, but, you know, it can turn out badly. So Sita wants Rama to hunt the deer if things go badly. Valmiki invents poetry in the whole, in the beginning because He's cursing, spontaneously cursing this hunter. And the whole situation started out even, as we saw, when the Sharata gets cursed, when he goes on a hunting ex expedition and accidentally shoots this boy. And his parents curse him that he's gonna lose his son too. So hunting, you know, it doesn't work out so well um, for people. But and you can see this also, it, it drives the plot in Mabharata in a number of ways as well. And and women. Srupanika's desire for Ram, Ravan's desire for Sita. We saw also Sugriva, the monkey, his desire for sort of just women in general. There are lots of places where 
or for monkey females in general, uh, where this is something that pops up in the text as something that you should be careful of. But so briefly, you know, Rama is also, and this is one of the more contentious things, he is an honorable guy who puts the kingdom first. This is something that is a core point in the text, but it's something that has vexed commentators and uh, appreciators uh, ever since. So what does this mean? He protects people who come to him for refuge. Right? So Bhutishana, Rama's brother, comes to him. He's a demon and whatever. And everyone says, we shouldn't trust him. He can be a spy, blah, blah, blah. Rama says, no, he came to me seeking refuge. Uh, we're going to take him on and winds up making him king of Lanka. Similarly, Sugriv comes to Rama for refuge. And what does Rama wind up doing? He winds up killing in cold blood this guy's brother. He winds up killing Bali. So, I mean, and this is morally questionable for a, a number of reasons, but we have limited time to, you can go back and look at it. I would point out specifically, um, you know, look at 101, where you see uh, Vali's question, when Rama shoots him, uh, Vali stands up and they have a long conversation where he says, why would you do this? What do you, do you think it is the Kali Yuga that you can just, you know, shoot someone from the bushes? You don't even have a beef with him. He's fighting someone else. This is not heroic behavior. This is not kingly behavior. You don't just come and shoot someone when they're not paying attention. That's not it's not chivalrous, basically. Why would you do that? And Ram sort of prevaricates and makes some arguments about, well, you know, you did all this stuff, and anyway, you should know better because you're not really a monkey, you're a god, and all, whatever. Finally, Lakshman steps in. You'll find this on 104, and Lakshman steps in and says, you know, the reason he did it was because he already made a deal with Sugriva. And if you saw him, you might ask him to protect you too, and then he'd be stuck. So it's easier just to go ahead and kill you than to deal with that ethical quandary of having two people who are at odds with each other that have both asked for protection. So the upshot of it is anyway, uh, for Ram anyway, that he gets an army of monkeys that uh, build supposedly, they build this little bridge here so in between Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka. Up through the 15th century or so, you could supposedly uh, walk across that on land. So he gets this army of monkeys and he gets uh, also this guy, who we've hardly ever talked about, but this is Hanuman. We'll, we'll get another chance to look at him, I hope. He, like, he can change sizes, he's like super powerful, but he's the paradigmatic devotee of Rama. That's, his, that's why he's ripping open his chest here, and you can see Rama and Sita inside his heart. He's also kind of the patron saint of bodybuilders and stuff. If you ever go to a gym in India, there's always like a little shrine to Hanuman. On <laughs> And he's the connection uh, between this tradition and uh, Tantra, which we talked about last time. It's kind of a Shaiva Shakta phenomenon. But here we see a five faced Tantric version of Hanuman um, that you would do a lot of those same kinds of rituals with. So, just to sort of point out briefly that Tantra isn't something that's strictly Shakta and, and, or Shaiva. But. Um, the key thing that, that comes about when we were seeing Rama being honorable and putting the kingdom first, uh, that's a problem for us, is this. This is Sita's trial by fire. All right, and this is a problem because, well, I mean, the reasons why it's a problem should be somewhat obvious. But what she's doing here is proving that nothing went down between her and Ravan. She's engaging in something that happens in these texts where, where women in particular can call on the earth or natural forces to validate that they're telling the truth. We usually refer to this as women's truth acts. And this happens a lot in, in the ethics where a woman can say, as, as Sita does here, if I've ever so much as fantasized about anyone but Ram, may I burn to a crisp? And then you know, sit down in the fire, and if she's fine, um, you know, it usually involves putting yourself in great physical danger to prove your point. But um, but when she's fine, then people have to agree that um, that she is in fact telling the truth. Uh, but again, she and and Rama have a long uh, and somewhat vituperous conversation about this when you know Ram rescues her and she comes out and he says, 
you know what, actually, I was just doing this to preserve the honor of, you know, of my clan and whatever. And uh, you, yeah, you just can't, you go away. I really think you should just go away. And, you know, so she has to do this to prove that she uh, is still pure. Um, and, you know, what's funny, you also see in, uh, in the text that we read that right after this happens, the gods intervene. The gods come down and say, hey, Ram, don't forget, you are God. You and Sita together are God. You're Vishnu and Lakshmi. You don't really have to do this stuff, right? This is like, this is kind of beneath you. You don't forget who you are and what you're doing. You're acting uh, in a way that's unbefitting. The story as we have it sort of ends there, um, but you know, to end on a total downer, let me just fill you in uh, with what happens um, in, the, in the, the later uh, later episode here. So they, they go back, everything's great. You have the Ram Rajya going, right? This perfect golden age. And as any perfect king would do, Ram developed the habit of going out at night um, undercover to spy on the people. And so one day he's, he's wandering around and he hears this couple quarreling. Uh, you got a husband and a wife, and the husband thinks that the wife's been stepping out on him. And the wife says, look, Ram is this perfect guy. And his wife lived with another man for months and months, and he took her back. So what's your problem? Like, cut me a break. So Ram hears this and decides, of course, that what he needs to do then is exile Sita, because this is leading to people that are making wrong inferences. People think that, that things have gone on that haven't, or whatever. So he's very nice about it. He just has Lakshman take her out to the forest and like leave her there. Um, and she winds up, oh, and by the way, she's pregnant. So he winds up at Valmiki's ashram, gives birth to a son, uh, who, they named, who she named Lava, rather. And, you know, it's the short version of this is that, you know, one day she takes Lava down, she goes to have a bath. <laughs> Valmiki comes back and doesn't see Lava at the house. Um, and being a wise, you know, semi-omniscient sage, uh, infers from this that he's wandered out and got eaten by a tiger or something. So he does what anybody would do. He takes some kusha grass and he clones another one just like him. Um, so Sita comes back and now she's got, she comes back with her kid and there's another one just like him there, which they named Kusha <laughs> after the grass made up. She's like, congratulations, you're a single mother of two now. <laughs> um, so these kids, you know, they grow up, they learn, they become great warriors and so on. Rama conducts a horse sacrifice, and they capture the horse. They, uh, they defeat Lakshman when he comes out to deal with it. And when Rama figures out that he's got these sons, he goes to Sita and says, hey, I, I didn't know we had kids. You know, you, you can come back. Why don't you come back? You know, we'll, we'll just do another, like, you know, trial by fire thing for, like, public appearances or whatever. And, um, and Sita is not having it. She, like, calls on Mother Earth, and a hole opens up in the ground, and she disappears. Um, so lots of people, you know, don't really like this aspect of the story. It is, it does seem to be a couple centuries later, perhaps, than the, the core part of the story, but it is there. And it's another way that we can see uh, something that's supposedly good, right? Putting the kingdom first, doing what's honorable, even if it has adverse effects to you personally, but that basically is awful for everybody concerned. So that's the uh, that's the lesson of the Ramayana.